I remember the whole beginning as a succession of flights and drops, a little seesaw of the right throbs and the wrong. After rising in town to meet his appeal, I had at all events a couple of very bad days. Found all my doubts bristle again, felt indeed sure I had made a mistake. In this state of mind, I spent the long hours of bumping, swinging coach that carried me to the stopping place at which I was to be met by a vehicle from the house. This convenience, I was told, had been ordered, and I found, toward the close of the June afternoon, a commodious fly in waiting for me. Driving at that hour, on a lovely day, through a country the summer sweetness of which served as a friendly welcome, my fortitude revived and, as we turned into the avenue, took a flight that was probably but a proof of the point to which it had sunk. I suppose I had expected, or had dreaded, something so dreary that would greet that what greeted me was a good surprise. I remember as a thoroughly pleasant impression the broad, clear front, its open windows and fresh curtains, and the pair of maids looking out. I remember the lawn and the bright flowers and the crunch of my wheels on the gravel and the clustered tree tops, tops over which the rooks circled and cawed in the golden sky. The scene had a greatness that made it a different affair from my own scant home. And there immediately appeared at the door, with a little girl in her hand, a civil person who dropped me as decent a curtsy as if I had been the mistress of a dis- or a distinguished visitor. I had received in Harley Street a narrower notion of the place, and that, as I recalled it, made me think the proprietor still more of a gentleman, suggested that what I was to enjoy might be a matter beyond his promise. I had no drop again till the next day, for I was carried triumphantly through the following hours by my introduction to the younger of my pupils. The little girl who accompanied Mrs. Gross affected me on the spot as a creature too charming not to make it a great fortune to have to do with her. She was the most beautiful child I had ever seen, and I afterwards wondered why my employer hadn't made more of a point to me of this. I slept little that night. I was too much excited, and this astonished me too, I recollect, remained with me, added to my sense of the liberality with which I was treated. The large, impressive room, one of the best in the house, the great state bed, as I almost felt it, the figured full draperies, the long grasses in which, for the first time, I could see myself, the long glasses in which, for the first time, I could see myself from head to foot, all struck me, like the wonderful appeal of my small charge, as so many things thrown in. It was thrown in as well from the first moment that I should get on with Mrs. Gross in a relation over which, on my way, in the coach, I fear I had rather brooded. The one appearance, indeed, that in this early outlook might have made me shrink again was that of her being so inordinately glad to see me. I felt within half an hour that she was so glad, stout, simple, plain, clean, wholesome woman, as to be positively on her guard against showing it too much. I wondered even then a little why she should wish not to show it, and that, with reflection, with suspicion, might of course have made me uneasy. But it was a comfort that there could be no uneasiness in a connection with anything so beatific as the radiant image of my little girl, the vision of whose angelic beauty had probably more than anything else to do with the restlessness that, before morning, made me several times rise and wander about my room to take in the whole picture and prospect, to watch from my open window the faint summer dawn, to look at such stretches of the rest of the house as I could catch, and to listen, while in the fading dusk the first birds began to twitter, for the possible recurrence of a sound or two, less natural and not without but within, that I had fancied I heard. There had been a moment when I believed I recognized, faint and far, the cry of a child. There had been another when I found myself just consciously starting as at the passage, before my door, of a light footstep. But these fancies were not marked enough not to be thrown off, and it is only in the light or the gloom, I should rather say, of other and subsequent matters that they now come back to me. 
To watch, teach, form little Flora would too evidently be the making of a happy and useful life. It had been agreed between us downstairs that after this first occasion I should have her as a matter of course at night, her small white bed being already arranged to that end in my room. What I had undertaken was the whole care of her, and she had remained just as just this last time with Mrs. Gross only as an effect of our consideration for my inevitable strangeness and her natural timidity. In spite of this timidity, which the child herself, in the oddest way in the world, had been perfectly frank and brave about, allowing it, without a sign of uncomfortable consciousness, with the deep, sweet serenity indeed of one of Raphael's holy infants, to be discussed, to be imputed to her, and to determine us, I felt quite sure she would presently like me. It was part of what I already liked Mrs. Gross herself for, the pleasure I could see her feel in my admiration and wonder as I sat at supper with four tall candles and with my pupil, in a high chair and bib, brightly facing me between them over bread and milk. There were naturally things that in Flora's presence could pass between us only as prodigious and gratified looks, obscure and roundabout illusions. And the little boy, does he look like her? Is he too so very remarkable? One wouldn't, it was already conveyed between us, too gro grossly flatter a child. Oh, miss, most remarkable. If you think well of this one, and she stood there with a plate in her hand, beaming at our companion, who looked from one of us to the other with placid heavenly eyes that contained nothing but to check, nothing to check us. Yes, if I do, you will be carried away by the little gentleman. Well, that, I think, is what I came for, to be carried away. I'm afraid, however, I remember feeling the impulse to add, I'm rather easily carried away. I was carried away in London. I can still see Mrs. Gross's broad face as she took this in. In Harley Street? In Harley Street. Well, miss, you're not the first, and you won't be the last. Oh, I've no pretensions, I could laugh, to being the only one. My other pupil, at any rate, as I understand, comes back tomorrow? Not tomorrow, Friday, miss. He arrives as he did by the coach under care of the guard and is to be met by the same carriage. I forthwith wanted to know if the proper as well as the pleasant and friendly thing wouldn't therefore be that on the arrival of the public conveyance I should await him with his little sister a proposition to which Mrs. Gross assented so heartily that I somehow took her manner as a kind of comforting pledge, never falsified, thank heaven, that we should on every question be quite as one. Oh, she was glad I was there. What I felt the next day was, I suppose, nothing that could be fairly called a reaction from the cheer of my arrival. It was probably at the most only a slight oppression produced by a fuller measure of the scale. As I walked round them, gazed up at them, took them in, of my new circumstances. They had, as it were, an extent and mass for which I had not been prepared and in the presence of which I found myself, freshly, a little scared not less than a little proud. Regular lessons in this agitation certainly suffered some wrong. I reflected that my first duty was, by the gentlest arts I could contrive, to win the child into the sense of knowing me. I spent the day with her out of doors. I arranged with her, to her great satisfaction, that it should be she, she only, who might show me the place. She showed it step by step and room by room and secret by secret with droll, delightful, childish talk about it and with the result in half an hour of our becoming tre tremendous friends. Young as she was, I was struck throughout our little tour with her confidence and courage, with the way in empty chambers and dull corridors, on crooked, crooked staircases that made me pause, and even on the summit of an old mission machicolated square tower that made me dizzy, her morning music, her disposition to tell me so many more things than, I, than she asked, rang out and led me on. I have not seen Bly since the day I left it, and I dare say that to 
my present older and more informed eyes, it would show a very reduced importance. But as my little conductress, with her hair of gold and her frock of blue, danced before me round corners and pattered down passages, I had the view of a castle of romance inhabited by a rosy sprite, such a place as would somehow, for diversion of the young idea, take all color out of storybooks and fairy tales. Wasn't it just a storybook over which I had fallen a doze and a dream? No, it was a big, ugly, antique, but convenient house, embodying a few features of a building still older, half displaced and half utilized, in which I had the fancy of our being almost as lost as a handful of passengers in a great drifting ship. Well, I was strangely at the helm,